All right, hello everybody. So we have finished up African kingdoms. So our next unit is about the dynasties of China. Now we're not gonna finish this unit before Christmas break. So we're gonna do part of it now, part when we come back in January. So what we're gonna start off first is we're gonna start with chapter one, the first emperor. And we wanna keep in mind the big question of this chapter. So it says, what are some of the things the first emperor did to unite China? So as we read, we're going to come around and see some things that he did to help China stay united as one country. The Emperor's Clay Army. In the spring of 1974, some villagers in central China needed a new well. The well diggers' muscles ached as they dug deeper and deeper into the reddish soil, looking for water. At 12 feet down, they hit something, but not water. It was a head, not a human head, but a life-size head of a terracotta or clay. The face startled them because it looked so real, but it clearly came from an earlier time. The workers kept digging and they eventually uncovered the complete figure of a Chinese warrior buried, more than, buried for more than 200 years, sorry, 2,000 years. And terracotta is a baked or hardened brownish red clay. Archaeologists rushed to the site of the well. They carefully dug up the whole area. They found more clay soldiers, then still more, and clay horses too. In all, they found an army of life-sized soldiers and horses, about 7,000 of them. So it says, these life-sized soldiers were part of a vast clay army that guarded the entrance to the tomb of China's first emperor. Chinese emperors believed that they would enter an afterlife that would be like their life on earth. So they buried their most valuable possessions with them, precious silks, priceless objects of jade or bronze, and musical instruments. So this is an example of what one of the clay soldiers looked like. So as you can imagine, if you're trying to dig up looking for water and you hit that, you'd be rather surprised. And you can see the horse right beside him too. Each warrior had his own personality. Some seemed angry while others appeared cheerful. The soldiers wore armor made of clay. They carried real weapons, bows, arrows, swords, spears, and crossbows. And a crossbow is a weapon that shoots an arrow when the trigger is released. So guardians of the tomb. The clay army stood in silent formation guarding the tomb of the first emperor of China, alert and ready for battle. They were to protect the emperor from evil spirits and robbers. If a robber did manage to break in, he might not escape in one piece. The clay army surrounded the tomb. Over 700,000 workers built the first empire's tomb and created his army of clay. It took them almost 40 years to do it. The emperor did not want anyone to know about the tomb and its contents. So after he died, many workers in the underground tombs found that they could not get out. Walls and doors sealed them inside the tomb forever, and they were buried alive to keep the emperor's secret. So what was the purpose of these terracotta soldiers? Why were they there? So the terracotta soldiers were there to protect the emperor and his tomb and the possessions from robbers or anybody that tried to break in. Now, when the emperor died, he didn't want anybody to know where he was buried at. So how did he ensure that that tomb was kept a secret? So what did he do to make sure nobody knew where he was buried at? So the people that he had digging his tomb and making these clay soldiers knew where this um, his tomb was located at. So to prevent them from further telling anybody else where it was at, he had them buried alive inside that tomb. So once they were building, all the doors and walls were sealed off and they couldn't get out. So they had no choice but to die in there. What evidence is there in the text that suggests that the emperor's efforts 
efforts to keep the location of his tomb and contents a secret were successful for thousands of years. So how do we know that for thousands of years his tomb was kept secret and nobody knew where it was? I'm going to scroll up because if you remember the beginning of the story, it says that it wasn't until the spring of 1974 is when they found the clay soldiers. So they had remained undiscovered for 2,000 years. So literally 2,000 years after they buried him and all those things, that's when they were found out because they were looking for water. All right, we're going to read about uniting the country. And if I mispronounce these names, I'm sorry. We're just going to do the best we can. The first emperor frightened everyone. Named Zheng at birth, the, empire, the emperor came from northwest China's, Chinese state of Qin. When Zheng was a young boy, China was not a single unified country as it is today. Instead, many separate states existed, and they fought one another. Zheng became king of the state of Qin when he was 13, probably not much older than you are now. To keep his power, he had to fight wars with his neighbors. And after ruling for king for 25 years, he defeated all the other states. In 221 BCE, Zheng declared himself emperor of all of China and took the name Shirwangdi, meaning first supreme emperor. Shirwangdi established the Qin dynasty named after his home state. Sher Wangdi had to be very tough to hold the new country together. His old enemies still hated him, so he commanded that all weapons in the empire be brought to the capital city. He melted the weapons down and turned them into harmless bells and 12 enormous statues that he placed inside his palace. Sher Wangdi struggled to unite the many different states into one nation. Each of the old states had its own particular kind of writing, calendar, and system of weights and measures. This caused great confusion. How could you understand a written command from the emperor if you did not all use the same kind of writing as he did? Even the money was different all over China. Some places used coins in the shape of knives, while others used coins shaped like shovels or fish or small scallop shells. Which one was the most valuable? And if you or your neighbors measured out grain differently, who would decide which was the right amount? Sher Wangdi decided to remove these differences. He insisted that all the people use the same written language so that everyone in the empire could understand each other. Sher Wangdi declared that all coins must be round with a small, or sorry, with a square hole in the middle. As you can see here, round with a square hole. Now you see not all of them are round, but most of them were round with a square hole. And this was done so that coins could be strung together. The emperor established one calendar and one single system of weighing and measuring goods that everyone had to follow. Sher Wangdi wanted to travel easily throughout his empire, so he ordered the building of canals to connect the great waterways of China. He also commanded roads to be built, 4,000 miles of them, and trees lining the roads provided shade for travelers. A cruel ruler. Such improvements made life easier for the Chinese people, but the emperor could also be very cruel. He hated crime, and people who broke his laws were punished in horrible ways. Sher Wangdi hated any ideas that were different from his own, and he hated it when scholars looked back on the past and said life was better back then. So he had every book of history philosophy, and literature in all of China collected and burned. He commanded that 400 monks be killed because they made a promise to him that they could not keep. Even the emperor's own son was upset, and he told his father it was wrong to be so cruel. But you shouldn't talk back to your parents, especially if your parent is a tyrant. Sher Wangdi became angry at his son and sent him far away, all the way to the northern edge of China. And a tyrant is a leader who rules by cruel and unjust means. So what type of changes, either good or bad, did Sher Wangdi bring to China? 
So let's separate it this way. What were some of the good things he brought to China when he took over? And what were some of the bad things that he brought to China when he took over? So he was a good ruler, but he was also not very kind and he was very cruel. So some of the good things that he did is he brought all of China together by using one language. He also insisted they have a single currency, so everything looked the same. And he also had a single system of weights and measures. Sorry about that, my computer did something really weird. So he also insisted on a single weight single system of weights and measures, and he also modernized and built the country's canals and roadways. So those are some of the good things he did to unite China. So those just answered our big question for this chapter. Now, on the other hand, he was a tyrant. And his when he since he was such a tyrant, it included having cruel punishment for those that broke the law and those that just disagreed with him. So they didn't do anything wrong. They just thought what he was doing was wrong. So he had very cruel ways to deal with them. He also burned any books of history, philosophy, or literature. That way people couldn't compare what life was like before he took over. They couldn't say, well, it was better back then because they didn't know what it was back then. The Wall Builder. Sure, Wang Di gave his son a job to keep him busy. He told him to supervise the construction of a series of walls in northern China. Some old walls were already standing and Sher Wang Di wanted to connect some of these walls and build new ones. The wall building did not end with Sher Wang Di. Later dynasties built more walls. The rulers of the Ming dynasty built the last and the most elaborate ones. These Ming dynasty walls are the ones that we usually think of as the Great Wall of China. But the work began many years earlier, and the Chinese honor Sher Wang Di as the first great wall builder. The Ming Dynasty is a period of Chinese rule from the late 1300s to the mid 1600s. So I'm going to let you look at that picture real quick. So that's what the Great Wall of China looks like now. And they spent many years building this wall. Many different dynasties did different parts of that wall. The Great Wall snakes through China's mountains and deserts for more than 1,000 miles. Why in the world would anyone build, or sorry, would anyone need such gigantic walls? Well, Shi Huangdi ordered the walls to be built to keep them out of, to keep the people out who lived beyond the northern border of China. The Europeans called these northern people the Huns, and the Chinese people called them the Xiongnu. The Xiongnu were nomads, which meant they had no permanent homes and moved from place to place. They moved around with their great herds of horses riding like the wind. They wandered the open grassland called steppes in search of good grass for their horses to eat. When they found a place that they wanted to stay briefly, they would set up large tent-like houses called yurts that could be taken down quickly when they were ready to move. In contrast, the Chinese at the time led most settled, settled lives. Most of them were farmers who lived in the fertile valleys of the Wanghe or the Yellow River in the north or the Yangtze River farther south. They rarely left their farms and villages. To the settled Chinese, the nomadic Xu Nu looked like barbarians. And a barbarian is a violent or uncivilized person. The Xu Nu were fierce warriors. They would mount their swift horses and swoop down on Chinese villages, raiding and stealing from the people who lived there. Shi Huangdi was determined to protect China from the northern raiders, so he started building the walls. He sent 300,000 soldiers and workers, including criminals, who had to ma march hundreds of miles in chains to the northern border. Many died along the way. 
Once they got there, there was no food, and half starved, the men had to work anyways. So what was the reason that Sher Wang Di wanted to build the Great Wall? So he wanted to build the wall to keep people out. The people that either were against him or fighting against him or they were barbarians, he wanted to keep them out. So like the Shnung News or the Huns is what we would probably know them as, who are nomads and fierce warriors, he wanted to keep them out of China. He didn't want them to be able to get in to fight him. Did Sher Wang Di complete the, complete the construction of the Great Wall of China as we know it today? So was he the one that completed the Great Wall? So he's the one who started the idea of it, but it wasn't until the Ming Dynasty in the 1300s to 1600s is the one who completed it. Searching for immortality. In his later years, the emperor became worried about dying. Sher Wang Di was determined to find a magic potion that would help him live forever. He sent out several sea expeditions in search of islands that were supposed to hold the secret to immortality. And of course, the expeditions failed. And immortality is, is meaning the same thing as unending life, meaning you'll never die. In his capital city, Sher Wang Di set about building several palaces and gardens for himself. The emperor became so fearful that he slept in a different palace every night. He moved secretly so no one except his closest advisors knew where he was. Sher Wang Di was a mysterious figure during his lifetime, and even his death remained a secret. The emperor died while on his way home from a long trip, and only a few advisors knew about it, and they didn't want anyone else to find out. The only problem was that the, empire, the emperor's decaying body was beginning to smell. How could you hide that? They came up with a plan to have a cart full of rotten fish follow the emperor's carriage until they got back to the capital. That way they think they would think that it was the fish that stank and not the recently deceased emperor. Sher Wang Di had boasted of his descent, sorry, had boasted that his descendants would rule for 10,000 generations. But within a few years of his death, the Qin dynasty collapsed. Another empire emerged and another ruling family took over China and they founded a new dynasty. And a generation is a period of time about 25 years. So how did we know that Sher Wang Di was afraid of dying? So what did he do that let us know that he really didn't want to die and he was kind of afraid to? So Sher Wang Di sent many sea voyagers and other people across the seas to search for a magic potion for immortality. <clears throat> and he also kept his whereabouts secret and slept in a different palace every night that way nobody could find him and try to kill him. So he went on a long trip and on the way back he died. So what did his advisors do to keep his death a secret? So what did they do to keep his death a secret? So in this time frame, there wasn't a quick way to get from one place to another. It was taking lots of caravans and walking or riding horses to get anywhere. And so it took a long time for him to go anywhere. And when he was on his way back, he happened to die. And obviously, anytime somebody dies and they're not taken care of properly, their body begins to stink and to basically rot. And so to hide the smell of his decaying body... They had a rotten or a cart of rotten fish follow the emperor's carriage. So that way when they drove by or rode by, the people would smell the rotten fish and they wouldn't suspect anything about the emperor dying. The emperor dying. 
So that's all we have for chapter one today. In your discussion post today, you're going to list, let's see, there are one, there are four ways that the emperor united China. I want you to tell me three of them. There's four ways. I want you to tell me three of the ways that the emperor united China. So that's all for today. We hope you have a great day. We'll be back with chapter two tomorrow. Bye.